CNBC Titans. Centuries from now, people will look at Steve Jobs as one of those people who changed the world. I'd like to let Macintosh speak for itself. Hello, I am Macintosh. He's as a living embodiment of creativity and nonconformity and passion. No one personified Silicon Valley, its culture, its personality better than Steve Jobs. We want to get even more aggressive. Apple is not a democracy. There's only one vote that matters. Steve is never satisfied. He's always moving on to the next thing. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. He is constantly looking at the experience. You know, how does somebody experience things? Apple One, Apple Two, Macintosh, iPod, iPhone, iPad. Who can say they created six things like that? No one. No one in the world. June 6, 2011, Cupertino, California. It's Apple's annual Worldwide Developers Conference, and a special guest is on hand to kick off the festivities. CEO Steve Jobs has been on medical leave since January, but today he's back, doing what he does best. We're gonna talk about three things today. I mean, no one can demo like he can at all. He has a personally engaging personality when he's on stage. If the hardware is the the brain and the sinew of our products. The software in them is their soul. Who else gets media coverage for coming out with version four of a product? No one else. And before the big unveiling, Apple benefits from the cottage industry of speculation about what it's going to do. Apple is notoriously tight-lipped about products in development. There used to be a saying at Apple, isn't it funny a ship that leaks from the top? And when information is released, it's often at events like this. And Jobs is the company's frequent messenger. The release is iCloud, a service that allows customers to store all their music and other files online and sync them with multiple Apple devices. iCloud is the latest in a long line of Apple products that this charismatic CEO has introduced to consumers over the span of his storied career. He was born Stephen Paul Jobs. The future computer icon first powered up on February 24th, 1955, in San Francisco, California. He was born out of wedlock and put up for adoption at birth. As a kid, he was very influenced by the California 1960s counterculture scene. But Northern California isn't just a hippie paradise. It's also the epicenter of the country's growing tech industry. So, while some tune in and drop out, Young Jobs finds his passion in electronics. And soon enough, word of his technological talents starts to spread. Jobs' future business partner, Steve Wozniak, is among the first to hear rumors of this local phenom. You've got to meet Steve Jobs because he knows this digital electronics. He builds devices with flashing numbers that can count strings on a guitar and what note they're playing and things like that. Wozniak is five years older than Jobs and a tech prodigy in his own right. He and Jobs quickly bond over their love of electronics and Bob Dylan. We not only talked about what we were able to do, the technology we understood, and where, where we thought it might go, but we talked about, you know, philosophies of life. We just became, you know, best friends for a long time. It's the fall of 1972 and Jobs enrolls at Reed College in Portland, Oregon. But, as he explains in his 2005 commencement speech at Stanford University, college, for him, seems a waste. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, and no idea how college was going to help me figure it out. And here I was, spending all the money my parents had saved their entire life. So I decided to drop out and trust that it would all work out okay. He experimented with different aspects of that kind of countercultural seeking. He was interested in Zen Buddhism. He made a pilgrimage to India to see a guru. When Jobs returns to California in 1974, he's working a low-paying job as a technician at Atari, at the time the hottest video game company on the planet. He also reconnects with Steve Wozniak, or Woz, and the two set out to exploit their substantial tech knowledge. 
Atari founder Nolan Bushnell offers Jobs a cash bonus if he can design a circuit board for the hit game Breakout using minimal computer chips. He didn't realize that he was sort of a team, so whenever I'd sign something to, to Jobs, uh, he and Woz would work it out. Wozniak completes the task in four days. The duo seems unstoppable. But as Wozniak writes in his autobiography, when Jobs gets the bonus he promised to split, he lies to Wozniak about how much it was, shortchanging his friend at least a couple of hundred bucks. By the time Wozniak finds out, the two are on to bigger ventures. In 1975, electronics junkies in Silicon Valley are beginning to buzz about personal computers. Personal computing was still you know, somewhat of an oxymoron. The, the people who had computers were universities and banks and large corporations. And those few brilliant hobbyists who could do it themselves. Woz creates his own circuit board and presents it to Jobs. He recognized that what I had was really incredible and he said, let's start a little company of our own, once in our life, two best friends. His vision was for to take these devices and make them into consumer products, and so to do that, they had to be simplified. To scrape together enough money to mass-produce the boards, Jobs and Wozniak sell their most valuable possessions and set up shop in Jobs' parents' garage. As Wozniak and some friends assemble the boards for what will become the Apple One, Jobs makes his first foray into marketing. He didn't have the technical skill of Wozniak, but he had the, the, the networking skills and the human, the people skills to get their little enterprise off the ground. Jobs quickly sells 50 Apple Ones to a small computer store and immediately pushes Wozniak to improve upon the board. Steve is never satisfied. He's always moving on to the next thing. He is not interested in protecting his old businesses. He wants to rip them down with a sledgehammer and put something in its place. Wozniak goes to work and emerges months later with a prototype circuit board for the Apple II. It's far more advanced than its predecessor. The idea that computers can have color, they can have graphics so they can play like arcade games. They can even have pixels, individual dots on the screen for higher resolution pictures that look more natural. Steve insisted it have a nice case and they made fun of him for that because it was like, nice case, you know, are you crazy? Who cares about the case? He also insists that each Apple II come equipped with a built-in keyboard and power supply. Branded with Apple's colorful new logo, every computer emerging from its box ready to use. Steve came to the computer industry when people were had to solder the components onto the bare motherboards and put it together yourself on the kitchen table. He was the, one of the first to say, we're designing a product for consumers, he just wants something that's ready to go. Jobs unveils the Apple II to the public in April 1977 at the West Coast Computer Fair. It was love at first sight. The first time I saw one, everything about it seemed to reek of quality. It almost seems like it had a halo around it. It drew me to it. Fell in love with it immediately. Jobs receives 300 orders for the Apple II within months of the West Coast Computer Fair alone, far eclipsing the number of Apple Ones ever sold. By 1980, Jobs and Woz have sold more than 120,000 units. It's the beginning of personal computing, and Steve Jobs will become the revolution's first folk hero. Steve Jobs, from the beginning, wanted to be a leader in that revolution. And Apple's next product will make him one. Coming up on CNBC Titans, Steve Jobs takes computing to new heights. First time I saw Macintosh, the angels sang and the clouds parted. It was a religious experience. Silicon Valley, 1979. Steve Jobs has a hit on his hands with the Apple II. In just two and a half years, the company has sold more than 40,000 units nationwide and revenues top $45 million. Inside the company's Cupertino offices, engineers have begun developing the Apple III. But Steve Jobs is distracted by the innovative work of a rival company. He went to Xerox Palo Alto Research Center and saw the development work that Xerox had been spending, you know, large amounts of money for many years developing the first graphic-based computers. Jobs negotiates a deal. Xerox purchases $1 million in Apple stock. In exchange, Xerox gives Jobs a demonstration of its crown jewel, the Alto computer. Once you have a computer like this, it's like you've got the most powerful computer in the world. You never go back. The Alto employs a radically new concept, visually rich, graphics-based interface, based on a virtual desktop, windows, and a mouse. It's the way most people interact with computers today. 
Steve's idea was we are the personal computer company. We wanted to see this technology and then make it in a version for the masses. The Lisa was really where Apple wanted to make its mark and make the machines radically easier to use. Jobs slaves over every detail of the Lisa and soon the computer is far behind schedule. Apple will spend $50 million developing it, but money at this time is not a problem. In December 1980, Apple goes public in the biggest initial public offering since Ford Motor Company in 1956. And Steve Jobs becomes a Silicon Valley celebrity and a millionaire hundreds of times over. But even wealth beyond his wildest dreams can't quell his reputation as a hothead. Steve is famous for being scary. And um, there's a lot of people have stories about Steve in their face, nose to nose, screaming. The Apple board of directors understands that Jobs is the heart and soul of Apple, but they believe he's too young and volatile to run a publicly traded company. After the IPO, Jobs is given the largely ceremonial title of chairman and is pulled from the Lisa project. Steve was free to go off and design anything he wanted, do anything he wanted at Apple. He just couldn't participate in the real operating group of the Lisa computer. With the Lisa off limits, Jobs turns his attention to a small research unit within Apple that has built a new prototype for an all-in-one graphics-based computer called the Macintosh. Jobs wants control of the Mac group, and the board is more than happy to oblige. For now, Jobs is back to doing what he does best, leading a group of renegades toward a computing breakthrough. If you went to the Mac building when it was a pirate flag that flew on the the flagpole on the roof because they were very competitive with Lisa and the Apple II. Despite Jobs' us-against-the-world mentality, the press continues to paint him as a brilliant young entrepreneur. In 1982, Jobs cooperates with Time Magazine reporter Mike Moritz for a cover story. Moritz was an excellent reporter, and he found many unflattering things about Steve Jobs. He kind of uncovered the dark side of Steve Jobs' personality, including the fact that Jobs had fathered a daughter out of wedlock, and Jobs was refusing to acknowledge that he was the father of this child. And they portrayed him as this crazy, out of control, tyrannical nutcase, and he got so burned by that 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 was sort of the last time that he invited in the press behind the scenes. By 1983, Apple has far bigger problems than a bit of bad press. In January, Apple finally introduces the Lisa. With a $10,000 price tag, it's an unequivocal flop. And even Jobs, who poured so much time and money into its development, finds it tough to appear positive. Is this the ultimate office computer? Today? To make matters worse, tech giant IBM overtakes Apple in the personal computer market, despite the rival company's late entry into the game. In light of these missteps, the Apple board dispatches Jobs to find an experienced executive to run the company. After dozens of interviews, Jobs meets with Pepsi CEO John Scully. I said, Steve, I'm not going to come to Apple, I'm going to stay at Pepsi, and he looked down at his running shoes and paused for about 15 seconds and then looked up at me. And he said, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to come with me and change the world? To Scully, innovation sounds more exciting than corn syrup. A few months later, he signs on as president of Apple Computer. The company's stock price soars. As the release date for the Macintosh rapidly approaches, Jobs never compromises his vision. He drives his team harder and harder. I remember one of the engineers was working on what was called the Macintosh Finder, and he'd been working for probably 36 hours straight. Comes in, hands Steve the latest version of the Finder, and he said, I think I've got it this time. And Steve said, is it the best work you can do? He said, well, it may not be the best, but I really am proud of this. He said, I don't care. Threw it back at him. He said, go do it again and bring it back when it's the best you can do. In October 1983, a brazen Jobs takes the stage at a meeting of Apple's sales staffers and mocks his biggest competitor. IBM wants it all and is aiming its guns on its last obstacle to industry control, Apple. Will Big Blue dominate the entire computer industry, the entire information age? Was George Orwell right?
the lights dim, and Jobs plays a $1.5 million Macintosh television commercial made by feature film director Ridley Scott. We shall prevail. 1984 airs only once during Super Bowl 18, but it wins critical acclaim and plenty of buzz for Apple's latest product. That groundbreaking 1984 ad, probably the most famous ad in TV history. Two days after the commercial airs, at Apple's shareholder meeting at De Anza College, Jobs waits backstage. On the other side of the curtain, hundreds take their seats. It's time to unveil the Macintosh, and Steve Jobs' reputation hangs in the balance. He's standing backstage, and I'm the only person with him, and he is white as a sheet. His hands are shaking, and he said, this is... Uh, the scariest thing I've ever done. He said, I'm so nervous. The minute Steve walked out on the stage, he was transformed. I'd like to let Macintosh speak for itself. He had perfect poise, perfect timing. It was one of the most memorable Steve Jobs performance you've ever seen. Hello, I'm Macintosh. The truth is great to get out of that bag. In 1984, we had a terrific year. The Mac got off to a tremendous success. It was well positioned, and Steve and I got along great. But Jobs' bravado can't sway consumers beyond the initial fanfare. In 1985, the sales of the Macintosh started to fall off. The critics were now saying, it's not innovative, it's a toy. It'll never be as taken seriously. With hindsight, you, know, you could say we had an incomplete product. <laughs> there wasn't too much software. And so, you know, without software, what do you do with a personal computer? Jobs and Scully clash over the company's future. Scully wants to funnel resources into the Apple II in order to extend its life. Jobs strongly disagrees. He felt that was looking backwards, not looking forwards. And so we had a serious fallout. Tension between Scully and Jobs boils over, and Scully gives the board an ultimatum. It's either him or Jobs. The board chooses Scully and removes Jobs from the Macintosh division. So what the board wanted Steve to do was go off and create the next thing after Macintosh. He stayed on as chairman, and then he eventually went off and resigned. Scully and Jobs haven't spoken since. But for Scully, the passage of time may have put things in perspective. Looking back, it probably didn't make sense to push out the founder who was the visionary and knew how to build the products. And here I am, the out there, knowing nothing prior to joining Apple about computers. More than 20 years later, the wound still seems fresh. At his 2005 Stanford commencement speech, Jobs claims he was fired from Apple. We just released our finest creation, the Macintosh, a year earlier, and I just turned 30. And then I got fired. How can you get fired from a company you started? Coming up on CNBC Titans, Jobs tries to tear down the company he spent his life building. The next was Steve's revenge company that put Apple out of business. And later, Steve Jobs shoots to the top of the charts without ever playing a note. When Steve Jobs leaves Apple in 1985, he takes home more than $100 million in stock but his vast fortune can't bring him peace of mind. Jobs reflects on the experience in his 2005 Stanford commencement speech. I was a very public failure and I even thought about running away from the valley. But something slowly began to dawn on me. I still loved what I did. The turn of events at Apple had not changed that one bit. I'd been rejected, but I was still in love. And so I decided to start over. With $7 million in seed money from his personal savings, Jobs starts over with a startup. He calls it Next Computer. In his book, The Second Coming of Steve Jobs, journalist Alan Deutschman details the Apple founder's transition to Next. Steve Jobs really had a chip on his shoulder. He needed to prove the critics wrong and prove that he could be the person running the company. For the company's first product, Jobs and his team design a powerful machine. It was a workstation computer, something you'd find in high-end college PhDs and masters doing important research. Its stated goal was to build a great computer for education. But the real purpose of Next was to show Apple they were wrong for firing Steven. 
We wanted to make the first computer of the 1990s. What are computers going to look like in five years? This is the first one. Members of the tech press love the Next Cube for its sleek design and impressive computing power. But the product's target market, colleges and universities, can't see past the price tag. At $6,500, it's simply too expensive. It was kind of like if you were making Porsches and you were trying to sell them to people who could only afford Volkswagens or Hondas. In 1993, after years of dismal sales, Jobs has burned through more than $50 million of his Apple cash. In a last-ditch effort to save his floundering company, he relaunches Next as a software company. Steve Jobs wound up losing almost all of the great fortune that he made at Apple Computer. He came close to losing that fortune with his failed investments in both Next Computer and at the same time his other company. That other company is a small unit of George Lucas's movie studio called Pixar. George Lucas wanted to keep the film companies, and so he decided to sell off some of his assets, including Pixar, which was this fledgling computer animation studio at the time. Jobs had purchased a majority stake in Pixar seven years before, but now Disney is at the peak of its animation prowess, and moviegoers seem perfectly happy with old-fashioned artistry. When Toy Story is released in 95, that all changes in the blink of an eye. Not only is Toy Story the highest grossing film of the year, raking in three Oscar nominations, but it's the spark that ignites a whole new genre of animated films. Jobs decides to seize the moment and take Pixar public, but this time he isn't going to make the same mistake that had cost him his job at Apple. Jobs wanted to make sure that he would still own a big enough chunk of Pixar that he could be in control. After the Pixar IPO, his stake is worth more than $1 billion, 10 times his Apple take. Years later, Jobs engineers the sale of Pixar to Disney. His stake expands to more than $3 billion. Kind of made him a member of uh, an elite club with uh, some of the other people who were his, his colleagues and rivals. He was able to say, hey, I'm a billionaire too. Jobs' personal life is also on the upswing. In 1989, he meets a Stanford MBA student named Laureen Powell. The couple marry less than two years later. Jobs, who was adopted at birth, also discovers that he has a biological sister, novelist Mona Simpson. Jobs also forges a relationship with his estranged daughter, Lisa, whom he had fathered out of wedlock. Apple, meanwhile, is in dire straits. It holds on for 10 years after Jobs' departure, but by the mid-90s, many analysts feel it's losing its edge. Because of the failure to innovate, Microsoft caught up, world caught up. Windows 95 has hit the market to much critical and consumer acclaim, and Macintosh's operating system needs a major overhaul if it is to compete. Jobs sees an opportunity. Apple was looking for something to replace the creaky old Macintosh system, which he had helped design back in the mid-80s. At Next Computer, it turned out that it was really the software that was the real innovation. In February 1997, Apple purchases Next for more than $400 million and brings back Jobs as an advisor. I feel very lucky I get to be help to make this transition and these products actually get out there. And I think the original idea was that Apple would try to use Steve Jobs. And that was a naive idea that you think that you can be the one to take advantage of Steve Jobs. That's not how it works with Steve Jobs. <laughs> you are not going to be the person who's taking advantage of him. Next on CNBC Titans, Steve Jobs regains control of Apple Computer. When Steve came back, he knew exactly what to do. Cupertino, California, 1997. It's been 10 years since Steve Jobs parted ways with Apple Computer. When he returns to the company in January as an advisor, he finds it in disarray. The company has suffered a long and bruising battle with Microsoft. Once the industry frontrunner, Apple now commands a mere 5% of the personal computer market, and it's bleeding money. In 1996 alone, Apple lost a billion dollars. 
With such grim prospects for the future, and with Apple fans clamoring for their savior to retake the helm, the board of directors implores Jobs to return on a full-time basis. In July 1997, Jobs signs on as interim CEO for a salary of $1. When Steve came back, he knew exactly what to do. He canceled the licensing agreements and took it right back to the way it was when he was running Apple. Later that summer, he addresses the audience at Macworld Boston, a gathering of all things Mac, with a new rallying cry. We have one of the world's greatest brands, and we haven't paid much attention to it in the last several years, and I think you're going to see that start to change. For Jobs, change means a fresh approach for the troubled company. He launches an ad campaign that sums up Apple's new direction in a simple two-word mantra. The Think Different campaign was an attempt to not only tell the world that Apple, Apple's core values are back, but to, to inspire the employees to uh, create uh, the kinds of things Steve wanted them to be. It showed a whole series of people who also embodied this ideology of thinking differently, of creativity and non-conformity and passion. For Jobs, Think Different also means forming previously unthinkable partnerships. We're going to be working together on Microsoft Office, on Internet Explorer, and uh, I happen to have a special guest with me today. Everybody was surprised when Bill Gates came up on the big screen. Nobody was expecting him to be there, and of course he was the uh, evil incarnate. People didn't want to see Apple getting into bed with um, Arch Nemesis. In addition to the shocking collaboration, Jobs reveals that Microsoft has invested $150 million in Apple and additionally paid an undisclosed amount to settle a patent dispute. The cash infusion is a much needed lifeline. Jobs' presentation breathes new life into Apple. Within hours, the company's stock jumps 33%. He also purges the Apple board of those directors he feels sat idly by during the company's decline. He then installs his own board of hand-picked loyalists to further consolidate power. He simplified the company on many levels. Uh, he pulled back the number of products that Apple was making to just four. In only six months, Jobs steers Apple back into the black. But to fully restore the company's credibility among consumers, he needs a hit. As the world moves online, Jobs begins work on the iMac, a user-friendly computer designed for the Internet age, hence the i. Suddenly, everybody wanted a computer. And then all the things that have made Apple great, this, the simplicity of design, the simplicity of use, suddenly made it attractive to consumers. You know, you plug in two cords, the power cord and the modem cord, and this thing's online instantly. The iMac's draw stems from its unique form as well. At the time, you know, you could have a computer in any color you wanted as long as it was beige. So to see a, a, a computer that was in blueberry and cherry and tangerine and all these weird colors uh, in a particularly sort of nice egg-shaped thing, it was very cool. In four and a half months, iMac has become the number one selling computer in America. With the iMac a roaring success, the lifelong Beatles and Bob Dylan fan turns his attention to music. Dozens of MP3 players crowd the market, but Jobs feels they're too difficult to operate. A lot of the other early players had buttons, and you would like click, 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 click. Oh my God, you know, thousands of songs? There's no way. Steve has famously said that design is not how it looks, it's how it works. Apple developers design a digital music player with a revolutionary scroll wheel that allows users to find songs faster. In October 2001, Jobs unveils a pocket-sized digital music powerhouse. There it is, right there. The initial sales surpass Apple's predictions. Consumers purchased 125,000 units during iPod's first 60 days on the market. But the following year, Apple makes the iPod compatible with Windows. Sales soar, and the company reaches even deeper into the home entertainment market. Apple had an incredible drive to obsolete the iPod every single year, making it better and better and better. The innovation, if anything, sped up instead of slowing down. As the device gets smaller and smaller, its capabilities expand. In its first incarnation, the iPod holds about a thousand songs. Today, a staggering 40,000 songs, or up to 200 hours of video. By 2005, Apple has sold 10 million iPods the hottest-selling product line in the company's history. 
But the music player is only the beginning. Next on CNBC Titans, Steve Jobs turns the entire music industry on its head. Steve Jobs came in with an entire different model for how the music business... Steve Jobs has made a retail splash with the fast-selling iMac. But Apple still claims less than 5% of the personal computer market. To get a bigger piece of the pie, Jobs has to convince loyal PC users to embrace the unknown and make the switch to Mac. His solution? Showcase Apple products in a sleek yet educational setting. Well, one of the things we want to do is create a place where people can learn not just about computers, but more importantly, what they can do. In 2001, Jobs oversees the opening of 25 Apple stores nationwide. It is so wonderful to be putting these stores with their phenomenal buying experience right in the neighborhoods of our customers. It's a high-stakes gamble. Sales are slowing industry-wide. And just as Jobs opens his Apple stores, rival PC manufacturer Gateway closes many of its retail outlets. But it's also a gamble that pays off. In its first year, 40% of the store's computer buyers are first-time Mac users. By 2010, Apple will have doubled its market share to more than 10%, while in-store sales balloon to $60 billion annually. Apple stores are the single most profitable store on a square foot or cubic foot of any stores in the world. Meanwhile, Jobs pushes into retailing on another front. This time, the inspiration is his love of music. The whole campaign in the early years was rip, mix, burn. And while everyone was enthusiastic about a cool new device, the rip, mix, burn, not so much. Up until now, iTunes has made it easy for users to rip CDs and transfer songs to their iPod. But the program lacks file sharing capabilities. Websites like Naps download songs for free, albeit illegally. But their reliability leaves much to be desired. On the file sharing networks, you had to do a lot of searching. There was all porn and viruses, and you never knew what you were getting. Despite the risks, file sharing sites continue to gain popularity. By 2001, Napster alone hosts more than 60 million users. Meanwhile, the recording industry is reeling, losing billions in potential sales. They were getting killed by Napster and the other file sharing networks. It was a big free-for-all. Their stuff was getting shared all over the place. Where the music industry sees a threat, job sees an opportunity. He makes a proposition. Let consumers purchase music online through iTunes. Steve has a reputation as being a, a hardball uh, negotiator, but th his negotiation with the music industry was the opposite. And he said the way to compete with free is to make it easy. If you make it easy, people will make these purchases. Apple's in the business of telling consumers what they will want, not to actually create what consumers have already expressed that they want. Jobs assures industry executives that iTunes music files will come equipped with anti-piracy protections. He very much spoke their language on stealing, and they loved hearing that because nobody else in the technology world would actually admit it was stealing. Here was this, you know, Moses who wanted to lead them out of the desert. But following Jobs to the promised land will require faith. He insists that iTunes sells songs individually for 99 cents a pop. Some artists are appalled. Selling songs was heretical. How do you break up Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Bland? How do, you, how do you break up Hotel California? It's not just one song, it's the whole album. It means too much. It's too creative. The music industry needs convincing that Jobs' proposition is in their best interest. So these guys are technophobic and they're scared, yet they're brutal businessmen. The last thing they really want to do is embrace the digital world. But they had just experienced Napster, <laughs> where, where they saw their business sailing away into the sunset. And the thing about Steve is he has incredible powers of persuasion. He can convince anyone of anything. Steve had this vision that certain artists were going to make this thing cool. And by getting those artists, it created a legitimacy. He took extra care getting Dylan, getting the Eagles. He was really focused on U2. The music labels give Jobs the green light. And when the iTunes store debuts on the internet in April 2003, it's an immediate hit. So now you only not only had a cool device, you had a cool device and a cool way to buy music, which nobody else had. The genius of the iPod was not so much the iPod. The genius of the iPod was iTunes. 
In little more than a year, iTunes will sell 100 million songs. Steve Jobs came in with an entire different model for how the music business will work and had a profound effect. Coming up on CNBC Titans, Apple's success is overshadowed by concerns over Steve Jobs' health. The big question about Apple and uh, going forward is Steve and his health. And Steve is the heart and soul of the company. January 2007. For months, tech bloggers and Apple fanatics worldwide have been buzzing with rumors of a groundbreaking new mobile device. Jobs is a master of marketing and of media, and he realizes the value of getting people talking, speculating, guessing, waiting, yearning. The secrecy is a big part of that, because if everything leaks out in advance, you lose that wonderful marketing opportunity. Jobs himself speaks to the media rarely and only on his own strict terms. He declined to be interviewed for this program. The company's veil of secrecy has been one of its biggest assets. For Steve Jobs to be able to sell products at such high prices, which is the key to Apple's incredible profitability, Jobs needs to have that window of time where he's in the spotlight, people are buzzing about his products. The product rumor mill is in full swing when Apple introduces its latest innovation at Macworld in January 2007. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. When the iPhone goes on sale six months later, frenzied customers line up days in advance to purchase it. Even Jobs' old partner in crime, Steve Wozniak, joins the throngs, camping out the night before. I think the iPhone may really uh, change the whole phone industry. Nokia sells about 500 million phones a year. Apple has a market capitalization that is probably six times bigger than Nokia, and yet it only sells one iPhone. Apple sells more than 6 million phones in its first year, despite complaints about spotty service from exclusive carrier AT&T and its battery capacity. I mean, you know, he's convinced tens of million people to buy a phone that won't even go one day without a charge. I mean, <laughs> I rest my case, right? In January 2010, Jobs releases yet another must-have device, a mobile tablet computer called the iPad. If the Macintosh was Jobs' assault on the desktop PC, the iPad sets its sights on the laptop. Apple sells 3 million iPads in 80 days. I think as we look back over history, that the iPad will have more impact than Macintosh. In 2010, thanks in part to the widespread success of the iPhone and the iPad, Apple surpasses Microsoft as the most valuable tech company in the world. Besides product rumors, there are more serious rumblings about Jobs' health. Some analysts feel that this secrecy leaves the company's future in flux, and Apple's enigmatic CEO has done little to reassure the public, often using coy humor to dodge the issue. We got some really exciting stuff to share with you. Uh, before we do, I just wanted to mention this. Despite the levity, Steve Jobs' health problems have been quite serious. They are first made public in 2004, when he reveals to employees that he's undergone a procedure to remove a cancerous tumor from his pancreas. He takes a six-week leave of absence from the company. Nine months later, Jobs reflects on his own mortality at his commencement address at Stanford University. For the past 33 years, I have looked in the mirror every morning and asked myself, if today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I am about to do today? He talked about death a lot. That was really, really drove him. He didn't think he was going to live long. He told people back in his 20s that he thought he was probably going to be dead before he was 30. And uh, he wanted to make a, an impact before, before he died. In 2009, after months of denying rumors of further illness, Jobs reveals he's had a liver transplant. His health continues to deteriorate. And in January 2011, he takes another leave. Apple's secrecy surrounding Jobs' health and the company's plans for a future without him have been a major concern for investors. 
One of Steve's weaknesses is he's not great at making himself replaceable. If Steve really clearly understood who his successor was, he'd probably be tempted to undermine him <laughs> uh, because in, in a way he doesn't want a successor. I think you could also argue that he's instituted his personality into that company, it's cemented in the way that it does what it does, and that it will continue to do that without him. One of those personality traits is his unwillingness to settle for anything less than perfection. Bill Gates has always been willing to adjust in flight. We always say in the tech world, uh, Microsoft will get it right the third time. Steve wants it right the first time. When Jobs and Gates come face to face at a technology forum, the old rivals revealed a surprising shared respect for one another. Well, I'd give a lot to have Steve's taste. Uh, he, he has natural, uh, not a joke Everything. at all. I, I think in terms of intuitive taste, both for people and products, the way he does things, it, it's just different. Uh, and, you know, I think it's, it's magical. In a rare public display of emotion, Jobs reminisces about the road he and Gates have traveled together. You know, when Bill and I first met each other and worked together in the early days, uh, generally we were both the youngest guys in the room, right, individually or together. I'm about six months older than he is, but roughly the same age. And now, when we're working at our respective companies, I don't know about you, but I'm the oldest guy in the room most of the time. And, uh, you know, I think, of, I think of most things in life as either a Bob Dylan or a Beatles song. But there's that, that one line in that one Beatles song, uh, uh, you and I have memories longer than the road that stretches out ahead. And that's, that's clearly true here. Apple's unforgettable Think Different commercial features black and white images of a handful of men and women who have made an indelible mark on the 20th century. There is one glaring omission. From the very beginning, of Apple Computer in the 1970s, Jobs has realized that we're not just improving machines, that we are dramatically changing the culture and having impact on how people live. And I think that's going to be his most important legacy. I think you have to look at Steve Jobs' role in America in the context of centuries. He is up there with Thomas Edison. He is up there with people who have changed the world.